When was the last time, when was the last time you heard his voice? And it could have been through a song, it could have been through a message, it could have been through a prayer time, it could have been while you're reading the word. When was the last time you heard his voice and recognized him as being who he said he was? There's always in scripture something special about third day. I need to preach a message sometime on third day Christianity. There's something real, there's something new, there's something powerful. Things change on the third day. Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for how long? Three days. Jesus was in the belly of the earth for how long? Three days. And I could go on and on and on. That's not the message today. But there's something very powerful. There's something unique about third day. God needs more third day Christians. And these two guys... These two were disciples of Jesus. They walked with him. They talked with him. They saw his mighty deeds. Isn't that what they said? We knew he was a prophet and mighty in word and mighty in deed. We saw the miracles. We heard the preaching. We knew, we know him. We knew him. And yet, as they walk along in all of their distress, their discouragement, their discomfort, their depression, and even talking about death, the same Jesus that they walked with came right beside them, and they didn't recognize him. The King James says their eyes were holden. In other words, they were held back from seeing the true, the true Messiah for a number of reasons. One, they didn't expect him to be alive. They had given Jesus time. This is in the afternoon, remember. So Jesus was going to be in the grave three days. He'd rise again, and by noon, we would take over the, the name. We'd destroy the Roman Empire, and we would have our Messiah. But it's way past noon now. It was, it was all a lie. It, he's gone. He's dead. And all the time wasted walking with him. And Jesus, Jesus shows up as the master teacher. Do you know what makes a master teacher a master teacher? It's not that they can give all the answers. A master teacher knows how to ask the right questions. A master teacher makes you look deep into your own heart, deep into your own soul, deep into your own experiences, deep into your own personal walk with Jesus. And the master teacher just asks two questions. What are you boys talking about? I, 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 I heard a name being thrown around, but you look so down, you look so sad. And, and, and Clopas speaks up and he said, man, are you new here? Don't you know what happened three days ago? Don't you, haven't you ever heard of a Messiah named Jesus? Well, he's dead and he's buried and he's gone. All of our hopes are dashed. All of our dreams are come to nothing. He's dead. Haven't you heard about the things he did? I don't know how Jesus kept a straight face. As these two disciples were talking to Jesus about Jesus. And he just, he, he went along with it. Boy, you, you, you boys look pretty down. You look pretty sad, discouraged, depressed. You need some tranquilizers. And then... Jesus asks the second most beautiful question. What things? What things did this Jesus do? What things? And then Clophas and the unnamed disciple, they could have listed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. They didn't. But they said things like this. He was a mighty prophet in both deed and word before God and all the people. And the chief priests, our religious leaders, our rulers, turned him over to be condemned to death. They killed him. They crucified him. But we trusted what he said. He said, after three days, I'll rise. We trusted him. 
And the only evidence that we have is Mary Magdalene running back and said she saw angels and she talked to the gardener and that's all that we know. And, and then John and Peter ran to the grave and they found it just like she said. Jesus was gone. The napkin was folded. But that's, he's gone. He's, he, our hope. Our, we left everything for him. And he's gone. What a meeting. What a meeting. These two guys, they walked with Jesus. Have you been walking with Jesus lately? If he came and sat beside you right now and whispered to you, hi, Greg, it's me, Jesus. Would you be able to say, Greg, yes, I know, I recognize your voice. You look like the Jesus that I've been praying to and worshiping and glorifying and serving. You look like him. These two guys are in the dark. I believe they were divinely in the dark. For a certain time. Are you in the dark today? Jesus said, okay, fellas, my turn now. You told me how gloomy and how sad and how discouraged, how depressed you are. Now it's my turn. And for six and a half miles... For about two to three hours, Jesus walked beside them. And he began to preach about Jesus, beginning with Moses, all the way through the prophets. And they listened. They were astounded. They, they, could, they were hanging on every word that Jesus, no man, remember we read that in Matthew, no man has ever taught like this man. He speaks as one having authority. And yet their eyes were still closed. Still didn't recognize him. I kind of wonder how Jesus walked. I mean, did he have his hands inside his tunic? Did he have his hands behind his back? Or were the, the disciples... Were they walking with their head down and not making eye, eye contact with this new companion on her journey? They didn't notice him. They didn't recognize him. They couldn't understand his voice. And Jesus again comes out as the master teacher. He says to these two disciples, Oh, fools! Wow. But you got to understand... That's how the Jewish scholars taught. It's not like school today. I've said a thousand times that in my classrooms, there's no such thing as a stupid question except the one you don't ask. That's a lie. There are stupid questions. And, and this Jewish scholar said, you're a fool. You walked with him, you talked with him, you saw the miracles, you heard him preaching, and you still doubt. You don't know him. All you do, all you guys have is a superficial understanding. You have a head knowledge, you have an academic knowledge, but you don't know him. You can't know him, or you wouldn't be walking like this and talking like this and living in total dejection. You fools. Slow of heart to believe. Jesus isn't talking to those two right now. Jesus is talking to me. Pastor Bob, why can't you believe what I tell you? Why can't you take me at my word? I have never failed you. I've never let you go. When you're sleeping, I'm with you. When you're working, I'm with you. Even when you're preaching, I'm beside you. Why are you acting so foolishly and not believe in me, who I am, what I have done, what I am doing, and what I will do for you? And then Jesus said this, Ought Christ not to have suffered and died, all, and all these things come to pass? It was meant to be so, guys. I've been telling you from the beginning, and then he went to the Moses, to the Pentateuch, and to the prophets, and he expounded. 
all the pre-incarnate, all the theophanies, that Jesus was there. He was there at the Red Sea. He was there at Jordan. He was there when they come. He was, he's the captain of the host that talked to Joshua. He was there. Oh, my goodness. Church, he's not only been there, but he's here. Right here, right now. There are three words I've cut out of my dictionary. And they all start with K, so it's easy for me to find them. Quit, can't, and compromise. I know the PH is silent before the K. But quit, can't, and compromise. It's too soon to quit. Unless you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Then you've then you got to quit sooner. Can't. Can't. One counselor told me when I was taking his class, the word can't simply means I don't want to. I could, but I don't want to. I would, but I don't want to. I could make this marriage work, but I really don't want to. I want to be set free. I can't. Really? If you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, what can't you do? With man, this may be impossible, right? But with God, all things are possible. Why are you so blue? Oh, you foolish disciples. And that's not the first time these disciples were reprimanded. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus had to stop praying twice to go wake up the boys. Can't you tarry with me for just one hour? How foolish. In his greatest need, his disciples fell asleep. And here we are, 2,000 years later. And as I read this, I have it all marked up. I've got notes everywhere. I don't know what the notes mean anymore. It's been so long. But there's some things I thought about. I'm no better than Clovis. And the other, I wonder who that was. Do you know why I think Clophus got his name in there? Because I think Luke heard the story from him. I think Clophus couldn't help everywhere he went of telling, guess what happened to me and my buddy on the way back from Jerusalem? You will not believe it. Isn't that the way we're supposed to be? Carmen used to sing a song. My kids loved it. They loved it. I got to tell somebody. I just got saved. I got Jesus in my heart. I can't keep still. I just got to tell somebody. And that's what's going to happen to these two once their eyes are opened. Will that happen to us? Will that happen to Broomfield Community Church? Will our eyes be opened? I don't, I don't mean for church services. I don't mean that. Please follow my heart. Will our eyes be open to realize the powerful, omnipresent, omnipotent, glorious God that we serve? I know we talk about it, and it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, I got it, I got it. So did these two, they thought. But it was all academic. It was not in their heart. It was not in their spirit. It was not in their soul. They were going to go home. Who knows how long they followed Jesus. It doesn't say how long they knew him, but they were heading home. They're going to Emmaus. But Jesus started the message. The meeting was life-changing in and of itself, Jesus walking right beside him. But Jesus' message was so powerful. It was so life-changing. It was, I surrender. That's what these two guys did. But it took the third M. The meeting was life-changing. The message was powerful and get right to their heart. And we'll read about that in a second. But the meal turned everything right side up. The meal. Jesus, I, I love the way Jesus is pictured in this whole situation. First, he just shows up from nowhere. And Clophus and his buddy can't recognize Jesus as Jesus, so they try to describe Jesus to Jesus. Don't you know? I mean, you're a stranger. 
Jesus was crucified. Jesus put his hands in his pocket then. Really? Hmm. I'm sorry to hear that. And he's dead. Oh, that's what happens when people die. They're dead. And they buried him. Well, yeah, that's pretty much custom. And he's still there. And Jesus says, really? Really? Is your God dead today? Oh, we know academically in our heads, we know the answer. Of course he's alive, sitting at the Father's right hand. We just live as if he's dead. I tell you about the C4 bill. And we shake our heads, and our head goes down a little bit. All the sanctions have been lifted. Oh, death and destruction is chaos everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Lift up your head, church. Jesus is alive. Amen. Nothing that's happening in our society today should take you by surprise. Nothing. Didn't Jesus say, if they tortured me and if they hated me, don't you think they're going to hate you too? That's why I'm nervous if we get a whole bunch of positive comments on our YouTube. I'm missing something. I'm not here to make everybody happy. I'm here to get you mad. If you hate Jesus, this ought to just irritate you. <laughs> And yet he loves you anyway. He loves us in spite of ourselves. It's dinner time. And Jesus once again. Oh, he is. Can I use a term that I grew up with in the city? He's so cool. And I don't mean to minimize him. He is glorious. He's sovereign. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Worthy of all praise, honor, and adoration. That's our king. But he's so cool. It's getting dark now. These guys have been walking for a couple hours. And they said, they're coming to Emmaus, and Jesus just, just keeps walking. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. Why don't you come in and have dinner with us? It's getting late. And, and spend the night and, 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 and stay with us, please. I love what the Bible says. They constrained him. After Jesus had made it look like he wanted to go walk a little bit further. No, stay. Stay with us. And he did. Can we cry out as a church, Lord Jesus, stay with us. Stay with us. When you're at home this afternoon, Lord Jesus, stay with us. David prayed, don't remove your Holy Spirit from me. Jesus, stay with us. We know you could go on. Maybe you should go on. We don't know your will in that respect, but please stay with us. We need you. We want you. We long for you. Jesus says, all right. Walks into the house. And this is where the meal begins. This is the greatest part of the story for me. This is great. Jesus doesn't live there. He's a guest in this house. But they sit down to the table, and the powerful happens. Jesus takes the role of the host of the house. My Bible says Jesus does four things. He took the bread. I think the ears of the disciples perked up as he reached and took the bread. That's the job of the host. That's the job of the owner of the house. What is this, what is this journeyman doing taking the bread? The Bible says he blessed it. He gave thanks. And he broke it. Ain't nobody can break bread like Jesus can break bread. Nobody, no man, woman, child, boy, or girl alive can break bread like Jesus can. He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. 
And the very moment that the bread was broken, what happened? Their eyes were open. <laughs> is that really you? Jesus, is that really you? You're sitting at our table. You taught us from the word. The greatest messages we've ever heard in our life. Was that really you? And before they could finish saying the word you, Jesus was gone. It didn't say Jesus excused himself to use the restroom. It didn't say Jesus walked outside to ponder the thought. He was gone. He vanished. <laughs> I wish you could picture it in your mind like I'm picturing that in my mind. The miraculous happened. The powerful act. you got to remember, Clophus and his friend, they weren't at the Last Supper with the other 12. They just heard about it. Perhaps they had other meals together, and they heard that voice, and they saw the way Jesus broke the bread, the way he blessed the bread, the way he provided the bread, and immediately they knew. Do you know when Jesus just sits beside you for a while? Can you sense his presence? We used to sing this song. Maybe you know it. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this. He's here. He's here by promise. He's here because he's faithful. He's here because he wants to do something so mighty, so powerful, so divine in your heart and in mine. And it all happened. It didn't happen on the six and a half, seven hour, or three hour walk, seven mile walk. It didn't happen through any of that. All these two guys knew that they were foolish for not believing. And they heard the greatest teaching session of their lives. But when they sat down for this, Jesus took the bread. He blessed it, broke it, and provided, and he was gone. I would try to run after him. I really would. And then once I found him, I don't know what I'd do, except fall at his feet and say, please forgive me for being so foolish, for doubting you, for questioning you. How about you? I'm being transparent. How about you? Will you stand when the day comes and all of God's children are brought together down here? Will you still stand when it's uncomfortable to stand? Will you still stand when it may be painful to stand? Will you still stand when you're incarcerated for standing. I pray that you would. Do you know how to guarantee yourself that you would? If you can stand now, you can stand then. Stand now. He did something so powerful through the breaking of the bread. And those two guys, that's the fourth M, the mission. They couldn't stay seated at that table. They got up and they double timed it back to Jerusalem. How do you know that? Because they met the they met the disciples in the upper room and they even beat Jesus there. And Jesus travels at the speed of thought. These two guys ran the seven miles back to Jerusalem and they said, Hey fellas, you're not going. Jesus is alive. He's alive indeed. He, he's alive. 
But the world seems terrible, but Jesus is alive. My kids, are, but Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Amen. He's alive. They had to tell somebody. Just got to tell somebody. Mm. Brother Mark at the store told somebody. And he's still alive today to share the testimony. <laughs> it didn't take his life. No one killed him. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. The worst they could do is say, no. I've been told no a thousand times. I think I deserve a raise. No. <laughs> I want to work less out. No. You have two. You know what I'm talking about. Jesus says, yes. I'm here. I'm here to bless you. I'm here to lead you. I'm here to guide you. I am here to build you up in the faith. But you got to meet me halfway. How do you do that? The same way we just sang through that last song, I surrender. Lord, I surrender my will to yours. Lord, I surrender my ways to yours. I want to be and to become and to do and to serve the way you want me to serve. Do you love him? Do you know him? Jesus' whole message was all about, you just don't know me, guys. You just don't know me. Almost every letter I sign, almost every letter, whether it's for church work or secular or pay bills, I always put Philippians 3.10 on the bottom. That's my life's verse. What's Philippians 3.10? Paul said that I may know him. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. We like the power of the resurrection part. But fellowshipping with his suffering? Really? That wasn't in my contract when I got saved. Oh yeah, it was. It really was. You want to follow me? Deny everything else. Then follow me. Take up your cross. I took mine. The power is resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable. That means like. Being made to conform. To become as. Ready?